What's happened in the past year? We're in a funny position at the moment. Um, Brexit seems to be on a cliff edge with the new proposals that Mrs May has put forward, which is not acceptable to those who want to leave the uh, EU, and of course the resignation of David Davis and Boris Johnson. Um, the news tonight is that Boris Johnson is going to wait until the autumn time before he launches a leadership bid, but one can't see that the plans that Mr May has put forward are going to be acceptable to the EU, and so one's going to be left in a mess, and it's going to be, I think, Brexit without any agreement. But we just have to wait and see. The angels have everything under their control. It does seem to be a very tortuous path that Britain is following. We thought, well, this is straightforward and simple. Britain leaves and uh, ploughs her own course. And hopefully that is what is going to happen. But we shall just have to wait to see on that side. And also in Syria, there's a, a calmer situation, except for the uh, Russians allowing the Syrians to take the space to the north of the Golan Heights, and the great fear is that Iran is going to move in close to Israel. So that, that's a bit of a tricky situation just at the moment. And we've got many talks going on at the moment, which uh, everything's just in a state of flux. So what I thought we would look at tonight was just a simple verse well known to all of us from Ezekiel chapter 38. So just turn to Ezekiel 38. And we're just going to see how this particular verse uh, is panning out because the situation in the Middle East between Israel and her Arab neighbours is something which is moving on the pace. And we can have a bit of stability there and just see how this uh, particular verse is coming to pass. And so, well known to all of us in verse 13, having described in the previous 12 verses the actions of Go with his nine companions coming against Israel, then presents to us that Go doesn't have it all his way. There are those nations who are opposed to what Go is doing, a very ineffectual opposition, but nevertheless it indicates that in the last days there will be a group of nations that don't approve of what Gog is doing in invading Israel. And it's only in recent years that we have seen the coming together of this situation of, in verse 13, of Sheba and Dedan, and merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, art thou come to take a spoil. So that's what I want to hone in on this evening and just see where Sheba and Dedan are and uh, how it is all coming together. It's coming at an interesting time when there is a growing coming together between Israel and the Middle East, and there's a growing divergence between Europe and America. And in fact, the front cover of The Economist, the current issue of The Economist, was headed the rift. And if you look very carefully, you'll see Trump's uh, head, as it were, and there is a rift, and today Trump has been speaking to the NATO leaders. I haven't uh, picked up any news yet on what has been said, but the drift was, as far as America was concerned, that unless Europe pays up more money for the cost of NATO troops in Europe, that he would do, would, will withdraw those troops. And it's, it is showing the drift, the rift that we have been expecting, between uh, America, which we believe is part of the young lines of the Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish group, and Europe, which belongs to the companions of uh, Gog. So, interesting cover illustrating what is happening now. But as I say, we're going to just look at this verse and see how it all is panning out. Now we need to know where Sheba and Dedan are, who do they represent, and as always with these things we have to go back to Genesis. Genesis tells us of how when the ark landed on Ararat, the three sons of Noah 
went their separate ways. And generally speaking, uh, the uh, Shem moved southward and eastward. Uh, Ham moved down through Canaan and into Africa. And Japheth moved into Europe and across uh, into um, Russia. So they intermingled a little bit, but generally we find Shem down there, Ham in Africa, and Japheth in Europe and Russia. So when we look at this slide, which we're not going to deal with, but this is showing Gog's nine companions, it is interesting that the vast bulk of them are descended from Japheth. Uh, six of his seven sons uh, and a grandson form the bulk of the people that are listed in the early verses of Ezekiel chapter 38. But there are uh, two additions, uh, both come from Ham. Uh, Ham had uh, four children, and Phut and Cush give us uh, Sudan, Ethiopia, and Libya. So two of the companions come from Ham, uh, the other seven companions uh, come from Japheth. But what is interesting is Jaben in the middle there, the middle son of Japheth, he isn't part of this conspiracy because Japheth, his son, is Tarshish, who's one of those who's going to be <coughs> in opposition. So if we just look at the equivalent, uh, let's just not let off at the moment, uh, equivalent slide of those who are in opposition. So we have Japheth's uh, son or grandson, Tarshish. Ham, who uh, under Cush, we just go back to that slide, gave us uh, Sudan and Libya, but his grandson, Rama, uh, gave us the first of the pairs, or two pairs of Sheba and Dedans, and gave us the first uh, pair of Sheba and Dedan there. And then Shem, who doesn't appear on that previous slide, none of his uh, sons are in the Gog camp, but Shem uh, gives us through Eber, having Peleg and Joktan, Joktan had a Sheba, and eventually follow down the Peleg line, we come to Abraham, and when Sarah had died, he married and uh, had Jokshan, and Jokshan had a Sheba and Dedan. So we've got two pairs of Sheba and Dedans, and a single Sheba. Now, when we trace out the history of this, what is interesting is the number of generations from Noah. Because uh, from Noah, the earth was empty and void, and the first generation had the whole pick of the world to go to. As generations move on, then we find that there is clash of nations and new generations come along and fight for territory. So the first Sheba and Dedan descended from Ham are four generations from Noah. Uh, the odd Sheba there, who plays an important role, six generations. And Abraham's grandchildren, they have 12 generations from Noah. So a lot of contest for lands when we get there. So the Ham's great-grandsons, Sheba and Dedan. Sheba uh, moved down to the bottom of what we today will call Yemen. And Dedan moves across to what we know today as Bahrain. Uh, Gustav's in there. Bible Dictionary says Didan, the place where they resided, is believed to be identical with the Daydan of the Middle Ages, now called Bahrain, in the Arabia deserts, an island on the western shores of the Persian Gulf. And they seem to have moved uh, southward too, so remained at Bahrain, but uh, offspring uh, moved further south. So seem to occupy the, the sea area. They were traders. We know from an early chapter in Ezekiel, which lists out all the different traders that traded in Tyre's fairs, that the men of Dedan were thy merchants, many isles were the merchandise of thine hand. They brought thee for a present horns or tusks of ivory and ebony. So from the Gulf there, they traded with India, where we get ebony and we get uh, elephants, ivory. Uh, and they brought it back to here, and then it was uh, shipped across 
uh, through the markets in Tyre. So that, that's the Hamatic uh, Sheba and Dida. Now, when we move on to Joktan, six generations now from uh, Noah, uh, Joktan was a very powerful man. He had 13 children. Uh, he gave rise to a, a town called Jektan in Saudi Arabia, named after Joktan. And again, we know from Ezekiel chapter 27 and verse 22, which describes the things that uh, Sheba brought, that they were spices. And the queen of Sheba, she was descended from the Sheba here. So although the Hamatic Sheba had gone down to Yemen, when we come two generations on to Jetan, his sons seemed to be much more powerful and took over the whole area and seemed to have just absorbed the Hamatic Sheba down in the south. Uh, and two of his uh, 13 brothers were Ophir and Havilah. So this was the general area where they lived. Now we move on another six generations from that to Abraham's grandson, Sheba. Um, he moves down to the same area that is still the descendants of Shem, where they had established themselves. And as far as we can make out, historians, uh, as far as I can make out, uh, Abraham's grandson seems to have absorbed himself into these. Now I should have said, just going back to uh, Jactan and his uh, sons, these regard themselves as the true Arabs. Uh, any descendants from Ham they regard as false Arabs, must Arabs. Um, so these are the true Arab <coughs> countries. Uh, so just going back to Abram's grandson, as I say, he seems to have absorbed himself in with them. But his brother Didan established himself up in the north um, at Al Ola. And we know <coughs> this is a case from two lines of evidence. One in excavations at this uh, city, a graffiti was found that this chap, Ramil, son of Bosprat, camped in Didan, sitting down in the evening time, nothing to do. That's what he scratched on this bit of pottery and it's been discovered. So we know that city was Didan. But we also have uh, from Ezekiel, an earlier chapter in Ezekiel, chapter 25, that Ezekiel paints uh, Timan and Didan as being very close to each other. Um, and you can read the verse in two different ways, but neither way makes any difference. So we know that Timan is uh, up in the north um, of Jordan, and so that makes sense that this Al-Ola was the northern Didan. And they were merchants, Ezekiel 27 tells us, in precious clothes for chariots. Now, the great trade between Egypt and uh, upwards there in chariots, and they supplied uh, whatever clothes were used uh, for the chariots. So, when we read of Sheba and Dedan, that's giving us a broad outline of this uh, Arabian Gulf region. And it is so fascinating how in recent years, very largely, it has become friendly to Israel, which is what Ezekiel would tell us. So, Sheba and Dedan, so the merchants of Tarshish, again at the time when Ezekiel was writing, again from mm -hmm. chapter 27 of Ezekiel, he talks about Tarshish trading in the fairs at Tyre. And he lists the metals that they dealt in, silver, iron, tin, and lead. But they were also general merchants. Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches. So a very general trader, trading all sorts of things. But there was this speciality of metals, silver, iron, tin, and lead, all important. Uh, and we know where those came from in these days. Tarshish, uh, we just to remind ourselves, was uh, 
Japheth's uh, grandson, he emigrated northward, uh, and the British Isles was known as the Tin Islands, and uh, the sort of Penguin Atlas of World History tells us that in the time of the Phoenicians, which is the time of Ezekiel, that tin and lead came from that region there. And we also know that Cornwall and Wales uh, and Ireland as well, uh, not only are sources of tin, but according to this report, uh, tin, copper ores, lead, zinc, silver, arsenic, antimony, sulphur, iron, manganese were all uh, mined in Britain. The date of the discovery of tin in the west of England is not known, but it was being produced about 2,500 years ago, which is very neat because that's the time of Ezekiel. So we know that in Britain, many metals and the four metals that are mentioned in Ezekiel 27 as being traded by Tarshish were metals which are found in England. So we have very strong clues that when it talks about Tarshish, in the latter days especially, uh, it is pointing to Britain. Genesis 10 tells us that Javan's sons, Tarshish was one of them, of them were the isles of the nations divided. So it points to somebody that goes to islands, uh, a mariner uh, family, as it were. Josephus tells us that Tarshish emigrated to Western Europe, we know when Jonah wanted to flee from the presence of the Lord, he went to go to Tarshish and he went to Joppa to board a ship. So evidently Tarshish is to the west of uh, Israel. And Ezekiel 27, source of tin, lime, lead, um, and a trading power. And in, if we just turn to keep a marker in Ezekiel, but if you just go back to Isaiah chapter 26, which is a fascinating chapter about the uh, fate of, not 26, 23, uh, the fate of Tyre, how that in Isaiah's day, Tyre was a very prosperous city, but Isaiah foresaw through inspiration the day would come when the power of Tyre would be broken. And he just used a little phrase, um, verse 6, passing over to Tarshish, how ways, uh, how the inhabitants of the isle, is this your joyous city whose antiquity is of ancient days? Her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. So it indicates that the spirit of Tyre was to be absorbed by Tarshish, uh, and her own feet would carry her afar off. Of course, Britain is a long way off from the original Tyre, but is in the, a, a trading nation dealing with many, many different things, specialities in metals. And we're also told that Tarshish is associated, or the merchants of Tarshish are associated with Sheba and Dedan and Young Lions. Uh, and we know that Britain is the only country that fits all these clues. She is to the west of Israel. We know from history that the early Britons were descended from Javan, ancient source of these metals. She is a trading power in the spirit of Tyre, and she has this commonwealth, young lines, independent, but are prepared to work with her uh, when need arises. So there is no other power on earth in the latter days when Ezekiel 38 is being fulfilled that fits Britain um, as, um, as the power that's being described as the merchants of Tarshish. The British <coughs> tend to run Britain down, but she is a leading merchant power. She is the world's largest source of international bank lending and cross-border lending, which is so important when you're trading, because although Britain doesn't actually see these cargoes, she arranges all the insurance and the banking and the financing for world trade. And according to the Baltic Exchange website, uh, London handles at some stage two-thirds of all the world's open market bulk cargo. So that's absolutely amazing. 
and Britain is the world's biggest market for international insurance. And the Maritime UK has a very interesting website, I have very interesting articles on it. And this was an article last year, just showing the role that Britain is playing as far as a merchant power is concerned. And it says that ship owners need effective ship brokers, lawyers, bankers, and insurers. These business services, many with a global reach, based in London and across the UK. Britain is unmatched for its expertise in shipbroking insurance and legal and financial services. More vessels are fixed through UK-based shipbrokers, more capital provided by London banks and funds, and more vessels insured here than at any other location in the world. English law is also applied to more shipping contracts than the laws of any other country, and London has the highest concentration of solicitors, barristers, arbitrators, specialising in maritime issues and dispute resolution. This range of activities means the UK can claim to be the world's maritime centre. And interestingly, just three weeks ago in the Telegraph, there was an editorial article about Brexit, and it was saying one of the things that Britain can do once she is free of the shackles of the EU is to set up free ports, such as uh, occur in Hong Kong and uh, Dubai, uh, and have brought great wealth to those areas. And the suggestion is that if uh, Britain is outside the EU, there will be firms that want to set up business uh, in free port areas where they don't pay any taxes, so that they can manufacture goods which can go into the EU, so there's not a double penalty, double taxation. They could contract, uh, contribute 150,000 jobs and add 9 billion to the economy. But just an interesting insight that, as a, a trading power, this is something that Britain is looking to do. So we see Britain very much is involved in this area, we're going to see in a moment in some signs. Um, but what are the young lions? Again, it's uh, a symbol that is well known and well used. That's a poster that goes back 100 years to World War I, of the Britain being an old lion and having young lions as the Commonwealth, or the Empire in those days, uh, the Empire. And we have this situation that Britain, as the merchant power of Tarshish, does have associated with her America and Canada and India and Australia and New Zealand and um, scattered around the world. Independent powers going their own way, but looking to Britain as the mother country. I'm sure I've read this to you in previous times, but it's such a fascinating quote. Out of the English Civil War came a race of Englishmen who lasted 300 years, who built the British Empire and saw it crumble, saw it not, and saw it not crumble like the Roman and Spanish empires had done, but grow into separate nations, as children do when they leave the family. And that's, you know, what Ezekiel said. 2,600 years, 500 years ago, young lions. And the Commonwealth is a very important thing as far as Britain is concerned. And just uh, earlier in April, whilst the uh, meeting of the Commonwealth heads of government, they meet every four years, and it was just the fourth time in the Commonwealth's existence that they have met in London. Today, the Commonwealth is a modern and dynamic network of people. Half of the top 20 emerging global cities are in the Commonwealth, and the family of nations is home to one-third of the world's population. So the Commonwealth is a huge asset for Britain. And we're so thankful that the Queen, and the mercy of God and guidance of God, has kept the Commonwealth together. Without her guiding hand, it would surely have disintegrated, but... No, she has kept it together, I'm sure, for this time when Britain frees herself of the shackles of Europe and has a large body of people who want to do business with her. So it is, represents a golden opportunity for Britain as it leaves the European Union. Now, 
Some of you will have seen this book, but if you haven't, it's well worth it. You can download it free of charge. But Brother Matt Davis from Nottingham a couple of years ago wrote uh, The Destiny of Britain and put forward all the evidences and much more than I've very briefly dealt with. But if you go to the Christadelphian Scripture Study Service site um, and just put in the search Britain and Tarshish, it brings up the cover of this book. You just click on it and then there's a download link. Um, so you can download a PDF. So let's just see how all this is working out. And one of the great problems is the Sheba down the south Yemen. For years and years and years, it hasn't been friendly to Israel, hasn't been friendly to Saudi Arabia. And uh, yet we know it must be. It's one of the key members, Sheba and Dedan. Uh, so somehow it's got to be brought within the orbit of Saudi Arabia. At the moment, the term the rebels, depends which side you're on, but the rebels are backed by uh, Iran, and Iran is stirring up a lot of trouble down in the south here, as Iran wants to uh, take or guard the waterways so that it can cause troubles uh, when she wants to. But just very interesting, just... Uh, Three weeks ago, uh, a new Saudi United Arab Emirates pact, backed by the US, launches this offensive against the port town. If I just flick on to the next, the, the main port of Yemen uh, is under rebel control. And what this is saying is that these two rulers, the uh, Saudi Crown Prince, the young man that came to Britain earlier this year, and the Abu Dhabi, which is the United Arab Emirates capital, uh, the crown prince there, uh, have made this pact to take Yemen. And so between the two of them, they've launched this attack, they've managed to take the airport. But it's, it's described as a thousand day war, it's been actually going on for 1100, well, we can add another 10 days uh, since I last came to stop about uh, nearly, uh, yeah, well over three years. They are, at the moment, uh, fighting has ceased as they're trying to bring about talks between the two sides. But the Iranian-backed rebels have many strongholds in this area, and it will be a very difficult job to dislodge them. But America and uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia are making this determined effort to pull Yemen back into the right orbit. So it's early days yet, but we can see how the angels have decided the time has now come, uh, I'm sure, for this area to be part of a, an alliance which is friendly to Israel. So what we're going to do, just to divide up the time, we're going to look at Sheba and Dedan's relations with Israel, uh, and then look at Britain's relations with Israel and the Young Lions' relations with Israel. And then look at Britain's relations with Sheba and Dedan, the Young Lions' relations with Sheba and Dedan. So, this was an interesting piece, uh, 20th of June uh, last month. Uh, Bahrain is said to be preparing to form uh, ties, official ties, with Israel. Uh, ten days ago, an Israeli delegation went to Bahrain and visited quite openly. A Bahrainian ruler is very friendly to Israel. He's told his people, you know, go to Israel. They are a very friendly people. You'll be made most welcome. And quite a lot have gone, and that is the situation. Now, apart from Jordan and Egypt, uh, Israel has no diplomatic relations with any of the Arab states. But Bahrain is, uh, this is unofficial, but this official from the kingdom said that Bahrain will be the first of the Gulf states to establish diplomatic relations with Israel. Well, we'll wait and see, but it's interesting because that's the original Dedan, the Hamatic Dedan, whilst Bahrain. And here is the ruler saying, um, you know, be friendly with Israel and allowing Israelis to go openly uh, into Bahrain and Bahrainians to go to Israel. So it's all moving in the right direction. 
Now, those same two gentlemen, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, and the, he's only 32, um, Crown Prince of uh, Abu Dhabi, is much older, 57, uh, as well as making that pact to go and deal with uh, Yemen, uh, the latest news this last week is that they're working with Israel and America to overthrow Iran from within. With the sanctions that the US is threatening to put, has already put upon Iran and will only grow, um, the economy in Iran is very dire. The value of their currency has absolutely plummeted. Great shortages, great shortage of water, um, and there's a lot of dissent. And these see that, well, one of the ways of dealing with Iran is to overthrow the Ayatollahs. And so they're working behind the scenes, Israel and these two Arab nations in America, to um, work in, within Iran to foment, foment uh, dissent uh, and try and overthrow the Ayatollahs. And at the same time, deal with Iran, uh, Iraq. Iraq's just had elections which weren't very conclusive, but the man that is emerging the leader is fairly friendly to Iran. So they're wanting to put influence on him. And of course, these two leaders have got lots of money, they can finance these things, to break Iran's link with Iran, Iraq's link with Iran. Because at the moment, Iran just thinks of Iraq as an extension of its country. Uh, if that can be broken, that will isolate Iran quite considerably. And also they are aiming to break the uh, influence of Hezbollah uh, and Iran in Syria. So, interesting, just at this time, alliances with it, working with Israel, Shiva and Dedan countries working with Israel to change the situation. The Saudi Crown Prince met with uh, Mr. Netanyahu back in March. He was on his way to Britain, called in at Egypt, and the Israeli leaders met in Egypt. And what he was wanting to do was to normalise relationships between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Quite remarkable. You know, go back five years, uh, that would have been unbelievable. But now the situation has changed so much because they recognise Israel is their great helper in overcoming Iran. So they also, uh, this young man has got very ambitious plans, we'll just see in a moment, to develop uh, a big area of northern Saudi Arabia, more or less on the territory of the old Didan, interestingly, and he needs Israel's help in doing that. So that's interesting. Netanyahu, back last month, three weeks ago, was in Jordan. His first meeting with the Jordanian king since 2014. There had been a falling out last year. Uh, there was a, a fatal shooting at the Jordanian embassy, the Israeli embassy in Jordan. And uh, the ties between the two were severed temporarily. But now things are back on course. And again, just uh, this week, uh, on the 4th of July, last week, um, there was news that a gas pipeline, which is coming from the, uh, eventually from the Leviathan field, the Israelis are building a pipeline up to the Jordanian border, and the Jordanians are building a pipeline into that northern part there. And the aim is to have the Leviathan gas, when it comes ashore at the end of 2019, uh, will drive the power stations. At the moment they're running on oil, which is very expensive, very difficult for Jordan to get. Uh, so they have this deal with the uh, owners of the Leviathan gas field to buy quite large quantities of gas for the next uh, 15 years, I think it is. So, well, that is in progress. These little things, at the moment, uh, gas from Tamar 
is being delivered to southern Jordan to the chemical works in the south there. That's already been running for a couple of years. What also is very interesting is to see the, um, how Jordan is being pressurised to come and join the Sheba Didam nation, Saudi Arabia. Jordan's in great difficulty, largely due to all the refugees, over a million refugees who come from Syria, thousands more with the recent fighting want to come into Jordan. And so that's putting tremendous strain on the economy. And so she is rather bankrupt at the moment. And it's interesting that uh, Saudi, Kuwait and the United Arab Republics have put together a package of aid and they said to Jordan, uh, we're going to give you 2.5 billion, spread over a few years, um, to help with your budget. But there are strings attached, as with all these things. But what was so interesting is that they're all to pull Jordan into the orbit of Saudi Arabia. Jordan tends to go her own way and be rather independent. But uh, they want Jordan, well, the, the strings are, you've got to stop any anti-Saudi propaganda. Uh, you've got to join in with the boycott on Qatar, which is a little state down in the south, which is very friendly with Iran and is causing lots of trouble down there. Help in the fights in Yemen, downgrade support for the Muslim Brotherhood, sever ties with Syrians, Syria's Assad, and call your ties with Abbas. And <coughs> as a result of that, that was on the 15th, on the 18th it was reported that Jordan told Iran that she wasn't going to renew her ambassador to Iran. So it looks as if Jordan is being pulled into this assembly of nations who are friendly to Israel. Here's another report on the yesterday. Um, the heading was a joint meeting of Middle East intelligent officials last week further signals warming relations between Israel and the moderate Arab nations. So the intelligence people from Jordan, Egypt, <coughs> Saudi Arabia and Israel Mossad all met together, together with the PA intelligence chief uh, in America, um, and they wanted the PA intelligence chief, this uh, Faraja, because they think that he will be a good replacement for Abbas, who is uh, a problem on all sides. He was elected to a four-year term, uh, and that expired about seven, eight, nine years ago. He still clings to power um, without any legal basis for it, and he is preventing any movement between Israel and the Palestinians. And so, uh, again, just an interesting heading, warming relations between Israel and the moderate Arab nations. And these same nations have been leaning on Abbas to move, uh, cooperate, do something, because as far as uh, these states are concerned, the Palestinian problem is just a nuisance to them. Uh, I recognise that it's very insignificant in the big world of the problem with Iran, and it's a barrier to their open relations with Israel. So the sooner there can be some solution to the Palestinians and the Israelis, uh, the better, as far as I can see. So looking at Israel and Britain, this now is slightly out of date because this is all about Boris Johnson uh, in the uh, human, United Nations Human Rights Council saying to the <coughs> Human Rights Council, you've got to stop this bashing of Israel. It is very anti-Israel, the United Nations Human Rights Council. And it was interesting that Boris Johnson was prepared to stand up and say to them, you've got to stop this, otherwise we're going to not support you. In fact, uh, the Americans have withdrawn from it. Now, of course, Johnson is no longer in power. 
but we shall see what happens. Three weeks ago, the Prince William was in Jordan and Israel <coughs> and Ramallah. He certainly impressed all the parties. He made very good friends with the Crown Prince of Jordan, a similar age, and they got on very well. And he made a good impression on the Israelis. And on his return, he made this pledge. He recognised that there needed to be peace in the Middle East, <coughs> and he pledged to make peace in the Middle East his lifelong ambition. So Britain now began to be more open in its relationship. This was a very historic meeting. For 70 years, the British government, the civil service, had been so biased towards the Arabs that they wouldn't allow any royal official to visit. So this was a big step forward as they recognised that Britain wasn't so dependent upon the Arabs and the Arab nations themselves, the moderate ones, were friendly with Israel. And so this was uh, an important step forward as far as Britain and Israel was concerned. Now Israel is a very good market. It's not a huge market for Britain, but it has a lot of important things. So this is a report in the last year, Britain exported goods and services worth 4.3 billion in 2017. Exports to Saudi Arabia are a few billion dollars higher, but Israel also has much to offer Britain that the Saudis can't. Israel exported to Britain to the tune of 5.1 billion. Israel has important technological innovations, and the two countries share important intelligence information as well. So there is this deep bond between Israel and Britain, which has been growing in the past few years. And an extract from that report, over the past few years, the close but often complicated relations between Israel and the United Kingdom have grown much closer. Among the factors contributing to the new trends, according to the experts, are Britain's planned withdrawal from the European Union, the shift in international focus in the Middle East from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to the global war on terror, and the return to power of the Conservative Party, considered friendly to Israel and the Labour Party. The United Kingdom, included in this, was, uh, um, sorry, it was in a separate report, but uh, of the 10 countries that Britain is planning to sign free trade agreements with upon Brexit, Little Israel was one of the 10. And uh, Israel is one of the 10 countries which it seeks to sign new bilateral free trade agreements. A joint working group has already been established towards that end. Britain must take a strategic view of the region ahead of Brexit and Israel has been tagged as one of the preferred countries in the first place. Despite Israel's small economic size in global terms, they, are looked at, they also looked at the contribution towards the European Research and Development Programme on the field of innovation, one official said. So Israel is important to Britain because she is so very innovative. And just last month came out this impact report on the UK Israel Hub. That was an organisation which was set up in 2000, end of 2011 to bring together Israeli companies and British companies. Israelis are very good at developing ideas. The British are very good at taking ideas and making them marketable and marketing them around the world. So in the past, many Israeli companies went to Silicon Valley, California, to do their business. They've now woken up to the fact it's much easier to deal with Britain, which is only two-hour time zone difference instead of ten-hour time zone. And uh, Britain has worked very hard by setting up this technical hub in Tel Aviv to bring together the two sides. And uh, it has led to 175 partnerships between... Um, Britain and Israel, and just brought a lot of business. So what are the young lions? Well, United States, Canada, India, Australia, New Zealand, they all have strong links to Israel. 
and foremost of the young lions, of course, is America. And back in December, it was Trump who set the ball rolling about increasing friendship with Israel by saying that he was going to, at long last, move the embassy uh, to Israel, to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, it was about 20 years ago that the forgotten which president he was at the time. Uh, said that they were going to move the embassy, but every six months they put it off. And Trump took the ball by the horns and says, we're going to do it. And in celebration of the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel on the 14th of May, they, his daughter opened the embassy in Jerusalem. And the Prime Minister and many other officials attended and said that... Um, Mr. Trump, by recognising history, you have made history. You can only build peace on truth, and the truth is that Jerusalem has always been and will always be the capital of the Jewish people, of the Jewish state. Now, a lot has flowed on from that 14th of May meeting, and now Trump is considering upgrading Israel's military status. This is uh, Debka a month ago. NATO has many members around the world, but there are also many countries that work with NATO to help them. Uh, but the problem is being able to have common um, communications and common linkages so that these countries which aren't in NATO can work with NATO forces. And back in 2014, you might remember there was a big meeting of NATO in Wales, and five countries, uh, Australia, Finland, Georgia, Jordan and Sweden, were upgraded to become major non-NATO allies. Um, Sorry, they, they, they became members of the Partnership for Interoperability have a job to say that one, initiative. In other words, so that they are operating on the same, way, same wavelength. And what Trump is considering is bringing Israel into that group of five. And his pledge that the US fleet will establish a permanent base in Haifa and Ashdod. They do temporary visits, come and go, but he's going to place uh, ships permanently there, as base there. And then also he's going to top up what the United States has a base in the Negev, down in the south. But he's going to upgrade the equipment that is there, pre-positioning is what they call it, um, and it says there, all in all, the Trump administration is providing Israel and its armed forces with the military resources for preparing for war of a quality and quantity far in excess of those possessed by NATO members themselves. So he is looking to Israel as being a key pin in US military strategy in the Middle East. And of course, if Trump does carry out his threat to withdraw troops from Europe, then the Middle East will be a very important centre for them. Now, Israel has reacted to this, and this is uh, on Friday in the latest Debka. This uh, Major General Alon, who was just about to retire, uh, his, he is the head of the IDF's operations. He's been brought in to head uh, what they call the Iran Project. And it's a project which involves not only Israel, but other nations, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE and uh, US. They're preparing for dealing with Iran by war. And so Israel will play a key role in that. In she has been very successful in taking out bases, of the remaining bases in Syria. And if needs must, then she will be used to take out uh, nuclear um, 
research places in Iran. So, under American control, they've set up this Iran project, and this um, Major General has been put in charge, and so he's been tasked with the execution of the decisions to attack Iranians, Iran's nuclear facilities, ballistic missiles, and military bases in the Middle East. And Iran's push into the Syrian Golan border has heightened Israel's fears of a fully-fledged war with Iran. So Iran might fall through internal dissent, or Israel and her friends might have to go in and deal with it. But again, it's interesting that uh, that similar plan for Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia is setting up the same kind of thing, the United Arab Emirates is setting up the same thing, all to be coordinated by America. Another of the young lions is India and the relationship between India and Israel only goes back 25 years because <coughs> India is a Hindu country and you know, totally different to Israel but the two countries have seen the value of working together. And last year uh, Modi, uh, the Indian Prime Minister, visited Israel <clears throat> this year, uh, Netanyahu visited India. Very successful, and a lot of trade deals were done. There's an awful lot of business which the two countries can do. So what are Britain and the Shiba Didan countries? Well, the foremost one is Saudi Arabia. This is the Crown Prince Salman, who came to Britain and visited the Queen early in March. Uh, he has this ambitious vision of building this uh, area, huge area, um, which will involve British help, uh, as well as Israel and Jordan and Egypt. So he has come to Britain because he sees Britain as a trading power and wants to increase business with Britain. And uh, it is one of Britain's best markets is uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, 30,000 Brits live in Saudi Arabia. So they did deals when they were over. But what he's proposing to build, um, I'm afraid that map is so faded you can't see the outline there, but taking this one here to the very uh, extreme north of Saudi Arabia or northeast, northwest, uh, that coloured area is where he is planning to build this new mega city um, with a $50 million price tag. But he's put it there because it's on Saudi territory, as I say, it's in the area of the ancient Dedan, but it's close to Egypt, it's close to Jordan, it's close to Israel, and he needs the help of all of those to develop this free trade area wants to move away from dependence on oil, gas, uh, and become a trading nation. So it, it's so interesting that that is what he is, that is his ambition. Whether it will ever take off, we don't know, but if he does, then Britain and Israel will stand to benefit greatly from it. As I just said, so Prince William and Crown Prince Abdullah, they got on extremely well. Uh, strong links between the two countries, Britain and Jordan. So, Bahrain and Britain, so Bahrain is the little island over there. Britain, earlier this year, opened a new base paid for by the Bahrainian monarch. He is so afraid of Iran, which is just across the waterway, that is willing to pay a lot of money uh, to have this base built so that the British ships can permanently be here to help defend his kingdom. So the merchants of Tarshish very much involved with this Didan, the Hamatic Didan. Um, so $40 million no pound base. Um, paid for by the government. So, permanent base for Britain and 
her new concept is east of Suez. Britain has got troops in Europe, in Germany especially, which she is planning to withdraw, especially as she leaves the EU. And one of the regions which she feels that the troops ought to be is in the Middle East, because Britain sees this as a most important region to her desire to be a trading power, trading around the world. And so bases in Doha and Oman and in Saudi Arabia are what Britain is planning to do to increase her military presence in this area so she can defend the waterways around so that trade can go through the Suez Canal. So wonderfully we see uh, the coming together of merchants of Tarshish and young lions into this region, Britain, United States especially, all friendly with Israel, all involved uh, in the region, and this region being friendly to Israel. As I say, a few years ago, it would have been an impossible dream. We've been privileged to see it as a reality. So, that's the end of the talk, so.